Um, I'm a member of Global Impact Church. I'm not just a member, I'm a minister in Global Impact Church. You know, I stepped in here and my mind went to Babsani Mashaun. You know, um, God has really been good. God has really been good. Can I put our hands together for the Lord? Um, Pastor Emi and Pastor Bimbo, I'm so proud of both of you. Um, God is with you, and we thank God for what he's done. Okay, um, I'm supposed to speak on the new rules of parenting. I apologize for coming in a bit late. It's not in my character at all. I had to speak somewhere that I got in an hour before they started, right? And they started pretty late, but it's good to be here. Um, good to be back home, and I'm excited to be part of this conference. I've always been joining virtually, but we're here. Okay, my slides, is it ready? Media, you have my slides so that we can run. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for what you're set to do. Holy Spirit of God, I ask that you speak to us. I ask that you rebuild our family and help us to be the ones to transform our world for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for answered prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'll take my reading from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Now, I'll summarize that scripture because the scripture you all know so well. It's about the birth of Jesus. You know, and something that was very striking in there, the Bible says that, um, you know, she will give birth to a son and you have to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from what? Their sins. I often say to parents that every child is a response to a global cry. That whenever we grumble about anything on this planet, or whenever humanity is under stress, and we pray, or we grumble, because our grumbling can actually be transmitted as prayers to heaven, the way God answers is to plant a child in a family. Oftentimes, that you see problems around the world is not that God has not sent a solution. The problem is the fact that the handlers cannot recognize the solution, so they divert the solution into something else. And that's why oftentimes I ask parents, if God planted Mark Zuckerberg into your family, will Facebook have emerged? You'd realize that maybe Mark Zuckerberg would have become maybe a musician or a doctor. Right? Simply because... The frame of reference through which we judge is often faulty. So when you ask believers, what kind of child are you trying to raise? They will tell you, I want to raise a godly child. Then ask them, what's the definition of a godly child? They can't tell you. As a matter of fact, they will tell you, if you now ask them, what are the attributes of a godly child? They will tell you, you know, the first criteria, the first attribute they mention is obedience. Not because they really want a child to be obedient, but they don't want a child to argue with them. So... And it's a function of the song we were taught when we were in, um, you know, Sunday school. Make me a child like Samuel. He was obedient and so respectful. He never argued with his parents. The question is, where did Samuel and his parents live together that he was arguing with them? I thought Samuel lived with Eli. Uh -huh. So you can see one of the songs that we used to sing. <laughs> right, so globally there is a parenting challenge. Big challenge that I'm hoping that the body of Christ and we will begin to raise children who will literally speak with the enemies at the gate. Where I live, I see all sorts every day that can confuse a child. You know, when your child goes for PTA meetings and they say daddy and daddy shows up and they say they are daddy and mommy, that's enough to mess up the sanity of a child. Um, I was sharing with some of my colleagues, I mean, it's good to see Dima here, she's our director of studies at the institute. That one day, I was in counseling, and a couple said they wanted to see me. Then eight people showed up. Right? So I was wondering what's happening. Is this a family issue? Apparently, it was a polyamorous marriage they were talking about. You know, my world frame of reference is a couple is husband and wife. So two people showed up, the original husband and wife. Then the husband now has a side wife who has a side wife. The wife has a side wife who has a side wife. And my brain first froze, but I have to comport myself as if I understood what was going on. Right now, imagine if you describe that as a family to a child. So I said to people that the biggest molesters and predators are the legislations of nations right now. Nations legislating all kinds of things. And that is why we can no longer be politically correct. We now have to fight back. 
And we fight back by producing children who are genuinely happy because there is data to show that by the year 2040, depression will be the number one killer in the world. But if we raise children who are genuinely happy, then they will be forced to ask us, how come your own children don't suffer depression? Then we can tell them. Because, you see, the Egypt must be separated from Goshen in the future. And we are the only ones who can make it happen. Right. So, the Bible says, Proverbs 22, 6. Initiate a child in the custom that he should follow. When he starts to show age, he will not turn away from it. So, parenting is literally initiation in the culture a child, child should follow. So, when I see parents who are parenting teenagers and they say to me, my teenager does not listen to me, I always ask them, what did you do in the, te- in the toddling years? Because I can't understand. I have a teenager with 16 year old, right? If it's so much on his um, device and we say to him, David, because of your academics, you need to drop this device right now. He doesn't even argue, right? So when I see parents who say to me, my teenager is always arguing with me, is that, 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 I mean, they, that they argue is not even bad, right? Especially because they see the world differently, right? But that you are not saying they don't listen to you, they don't do things, they don't, I don't understand because what you see in the teenage years is the report card of your toddling years. And what you see when they become young adults is a report card of what you've done in the first 18 years of their life because parenting is an 18-year curriculum. What happens from age 19 is your report card. Are we together? Good. So I always love to ask certain questions wherever I speak. So if I hand over your children to Boko Haram, God forbid, after 18 years, who will they become? Terrorist. Everybody seems to know the answer. If I hand your children over to the king of Dubai for 11 years, who will they become after 11 years? What? Emirates. You all know the answer, right? If I hand your children over to a Japanese parent, who will they become after 18 years? I can literally predict who they're going to become because Japanese children are the most respectful children in the world because there is a template for raising them that is built on the Japanese values, right? And this thing is intentionally scripted. Are we together? Right. But the question is, who are they becoming with you? Many of us don't know who our children are going to become. So we say, you know, God, we just do it. And you see, there's no vacuum in life. Whether you know it or not, you are unconsciously programming your children for certain things. So I have a daughter. When we go to, um, you know, the mall, my daughter does not go for the cheap things. She goes to the most expensive place. Only God knows how she picks them. She just goes to a place and begins to say, Daddy, come and buy this thing. What she's pointing at is about $3,000. So my wife would try to drag her away from the place and say, you know, you, you can't even start from what is cheap. No, I say, no, no, don't worry. Don't drag her away. She loves luxury, right? So I go to her and she says, Daddy, buy me this thing. I say, you know, I will buy it. You deserve it. But I will buy it January 1st, 2028. Now, I have not said no, but I've made it aspirational. Because in your bid to say no, you can also install limitation in your children. Are we together? So you have a child who stands here, a four-year-old, and says, Baba, amiko lebe, iya amiko lebe, eminiko lo lebe, be, be, be. What do you say to him? Don't bear all because you will break your leg. Now you have protected him, but you have also damaged him. You could have said to him, yes, you can jump, but this jump is for age nine. Let us create the jump for age four. And so he's jumping and makes that aspirational. So in a bid to say no, sometimes we include, we install poverty and limited thinking. That's why you see that our people never go for extreme sports because they don't want to die. In fact, when the whole world is talking about going to mass, we never show up there. You know what we say? He say, this be all you people, they don't be left. The people we never be left, cannot be thinking of mass. We never even possess art. How can we be talking about mass? It's limited thinking. And you see, we cannot impose that on our children because that was what was done to us. Our parents did the best they could with what they knew. But many of us were limited, right? And that's why many of us can't dare certain things. We can't even talk about, I mean, I love it when Pastor Yemi says they have fig, fig of Singapore. We have it in their family as well. We have Singapore. We say our kitchen will look like Singapore. It doesn't still look like Singapore, but it's aspirational. 
The children say, oh, we are going, we want our educational system and families to look like Japanese. You know, and we talk about it. You see, sometimes you don't have the money, but at least you can mentally travel there. Right? And that's why YouTube is there. You can play and show them luxury. Right? So don't let your child come and say, oh, mommy, can you buy me this? And you say, do you think money falls from tree? That was how limitation was imposed on us. Are we still here? So follow me. I'm going on a journey. Now, you see, around the world, the Indians, the Japanese, the Jews, the Chinese, they've been able to produce intentional results. Do you think it's by happenstance that the, most of the Fortune 500 companies in the world have an Indian CEO? That couldn't have been accidental. If it was just two of them, you can say that. But right now, when they are looking for CEOs, they are looking for an Indian. You know why? Because Indians understand precision. And Indians, when they travel, they carry everything, including their culture, out of this country, and they establish their culture wherever they are. Are we together? So I always like to share the experience of when we were shopping for a house, and we saw a particular house that had 11 Indian families. There was bed everywhere, bed under the table, bed in the kitchen, bed everywhere. So I curiously wanted to know why they were leaving the house, because the house was badly used, so I told my wife, we can't get this house. But let's even ask questions. So we asked them questions. You know what they said? They said when they got to Canada, they realized that a house cost about $2,700 to rent. And the 11 families came together to say, why should each family be paying $2,700 when we cannot live within the same house? So they said they started living in the same house, and they all made a commitment to themselves that they were going to co-parent their children together, that until the final family has bought their third house, they weren't going to live apart. So I said, why are you living? They said the final family just bought the third house, and that's why we are now going apart so that we can replicate the same model. But you know two siblings from Nigeria cannot even live together. Right? And so you can see intentionally. But why are they able to do that? Because in the Indian family, there's a concept called fraternity. When an Indian calls you uncle, it's not that you are related. It just means I'm a part of the Indian race. And uncle means you have to show me the way. Are we together? Right? So you need to understand that one of the things we lack as Africans that we need to begin to work on is systems. And the best way to describe system is system is one plus one is equal to two. So this is what many of us do. This is the way we parent. We say, so let's assume, and this is the way we behave. You want to produce afang soup, right? Afang soup is what I want to say, Pastor Yemi, afang soup. What should be the right thing to do? To go to the market and buy ingredients, isn't it? But this is what we do. We go to the market. We say they are buying vegetable, selling vegetable, but we ask for hibiscus leaf. So we buy a hibiscus leaf, we come home, and we put water on fire. We now put the hibiscus leaf inside water to be boiling. Remember, we want afang outcome, isn't it? Now, so we put it, it's boiling, we add sugar to it. Of course, you know what we are preparing. Then we now add a lot of prayer and fasting to it, right? And we say what God cannot do does not even exist. This must produce afang, right? Is it going to produce afang? So many of us are mean to our children, then we expect all some children as an outcome. How is that possible? Your prayer contradicts your action. That's why the Bible says these people honor me with their mouth, but their heart is far away. Your action contradicts your prayer. And so I always say to people, if God will interpret your action to your children as a prayer point, would you want God to say amen to it? Because many of us, our actions are bigger prayers than the words of our mouth. So you scream on the children, you yell. I mean, if your pastor says, a child says, uh, I mean, when we're growing up, your father will not even ask you what is wrong with you. He now says, uh, I want you to come to the back. You tell my father you want him to come to the back. And we brag about these things. I say it on social media. You say, all oh, these children, you know, when we're younger, who have we become? Our parents will say they disciplined us. No, they didn't discipline us. They domesticated us. A disciplined people will produce a disciplined environment. That we have not produced a disciplined environment is proof that what was done to us was not disciplined. Are we still here? So follow me. Please keep my slides on. Every successful race is powered by intentional system while others are powered by emotion. Now, within the framework of systems intelligence, I've left that place. Please move very fast. There are four things you need to understand. There are characteristics of a good system. And number one 
every good system has an entry point, which is recruitment. That's when your child is born. Now, when a child is born, many of us do not understand the psychology of a child's development. So when your child is not crawling, you are worried. You begin to run around, oh, this child is not crawling. But when the child begins to crawl, you fail to process the psychological impact of that crawling. Because once the child can crawl, then he can pull things down. So the child starts to crawl. Then you say, oh God, let this child walk before first birthday because I've invited my friend. Then he starts to run. You know that when a child starts to run, there's no more peace in the house. So your one-year-old begins to run and begins to pull things down. And then you say it's destructive. How is it destructive? You are the one that was not emotionally prepared for the changes in the life of the child. The same way when he becomes a teenager. To have a teenager and to expect that teenager not to disagree with you. You know, I mean, the first person I had when I came was Pelumi, Pastor Yemi's daughter. Because Pelumi was like my baby, you know, when she was going out, we had to have sessions. And one thing I noticed about her is her capacity to freely ask questions that you are not even thinking about. If your children cannot ask questions, in fact, it's been said that that children can ask questions is a mark of intelligence. Right? So don't even allow schools stifle their capacity. Because many of our schools, they say, you talk too much, you talk too much. Yes, a child should talk too much. There's nothing even called talking too much, depending on what he's saying. Right? Because some people earn a fortune by speaking. If your child's power in his, is in his mouth, let them talk. Right? But give them books to read and come and make presentation. Are we together? So you must know how to unnest and finish up the power that a child has. Many of us, we are the witches stifling the potential of our children. You know, there were meetings in Lagos many years ago called first Destiny Recovery for Firstborn Children. And I'm like, why? They said they notice that firstborn children, they don't usually turn out right. So I caught, went to three of those meetings and I ran a survey. I wanted to know how many of them studied parenting before they started parenting. We ran a survey, nobody in the meeting understood parenting before. So I concluded that the firstborn child is usually the experiment, is the specimen in their parenting experimental lab. And you know the specimen never survives. That is why you notice that a lot of ladies who are still single, who are firstborn, if you sit with them, check the complaints of the guys who never, who were, they were dating and dumped them, you will find that at some point they've been socialized to take responsibility for other people. So they start to behave like a mother to the guy they are dating. And after a while, the guy begins to think, ah, he's a lover, I want not a mother. Because our parents have conditioned the firstborn to take responsibilities for every other person. It's one of the things we need to change. There is no place in the Bible that says the firstborn must be the one to lead everyone. Let them grow up like normal children. Are we together? So systems intelligence becomes very key. Now, within the ambit of your entry point, you need an engagement strategy. How do you engage? You need a retention strategy. Now, the engagement code many of our parents gave to us was command. Just command them, they will do it. You know, two weeks ago, we brought teenagers to our meetings. We have an online meeting that we do. We wanted to know why the foot drag when parents give instruction. You know what they say to us? They said to us that the foot drag because we assume that they are not busy enough. So we just want to command them around anytime we like. And we don't give them a time frame to complete the task. So he said, for example, they are with their friends gisting and talking about important things. You know, as a parent, you want to ask what, is, what can be important. But it's important to that child. We have no respect for children. So they said to us, when you give us a task, tell us, can you sweep this place between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m.? Right? And by 10 a.m., don't come and tell us, it's now 10 no, it's now 10 no. No, let it be 11 and they don't do it, then you can talk. Say, so, but many a time, we don't even know how important what they're doing. You just say, get up, get up, get up. So they ask us, if you were the one that somebody is telling you, get up all the time, how would you feel? Many of you don't like the fact that you were commanded, but you are commanding them. Right? So respect has got to be reciprocal. And one of the skills we need to learn is communication. We learned how to talk. We didn't learn how to communicate. Are we together? Good. So after intense retention, you need an indoctrination system, which is called acculturation. Bible says initiate a child in the custom is follow. Within indoctrination, you need curriculum. 
So we talk about the perceptual code of a child. If you say every child in your family is a royalty, you'll need a curriculum that is called the royalty. We have it in my family. The children are learning something about a royalty every day. I collect Facebook videos 10 minutes every day, 6 a.m. They listen to it, then we discuss it. You know why I'm doing that? Because I want to be in control or at least influence what goes into their mind. Because when I was a child, what my parents allowed to go into my mind, in addition to Bible, are things you don't want to think about. You know, we go to primary school. Our role models were Abijah, Father Yoloro, and the rest of them. So you will be gyrating. Say, Those were the things on my head. How many of you can relate? That some of us are born again is by the grace that we're even here. It's by the grace of God. Because what they... You watch movies, you know, you know, you know, you know, everywhere. And when your mates are talking about it in school, you would think it's something serious. No wonder we didn't invent anything. Where is Abijah now? Those were the things they loaded our brains with. The songs they loaded our minds with. So for me, I know that whatever you install in the mind of a child is a seed. And the seed is often incorruptible. It will always show up at the right time. That was why when I got born again, there were scriptures I never needed to learn. Because every day you read Psalms in my family. So I knew some scriptures by the fact that every day, morning and evening, you, you, must, you must join. Even though it became very boring and after a while we didn't like it. You know, but my father will insist. So your acculturation needs to be strong. That is why. Do you think that when terrorists, when they pick a child, do you think they pray in the name of the devil and say, this child, you must become a terrorist? Do you think they pray? No. They trust the potency of their curriculum. That when we finish with you, you cannot become a man of God. Have you ever seen a terrorist who came out of their training and said, praise the Lord, and begins to speak in tongues? No. That's what the Bible says, that parenting must have an outcome. It says, happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies at the gate. What it means is, the magicians must drop their rod. Their rod must become serpent. We kingdom people, we must drop our own rod. Our rod must become serpent. But our serpent must swallow their serpent. It's called superior service delivery. Are we together? So that's something we all need to understand. That whatever you are sowing as a parent, harvest day is coming. And that's why you don't want to impose trauma or install trauma on your children. Wherein your children are now the candidate for depression. And please be careful what people call your children. You know, I see uh, outside Nigeria, when they see a child who is restless, they take them to psychologists in America, and they say, this child is diagnosed of ADHD, and they begin to medicate. So I call Nigerian parents aside, I say, when you were in primary school, were there children who were behaving like this in your primary school? Ah, he said plenty, he said that's a normal behavior. So I say, why are you medicating a child? Because the big farmers must justify what they are producing, and government must pay for it anyways. Right? And they say, oh, wow. So let children play because that's a type of child. Some of them, their worldview cannot be captured within the conventional educational system. But don't let them medicate your child. You must know your child more than anybody. So indoctrination becomes very key. Some of those indoctrination, you teach them at odd places. Beside the swimming pool, it's called anchoring. Sometimes you teach them when you are eating. There are things you do regularly. You can allow your children to even plan a monthly outing for you. Right? Let them be involved. I mean, when my daughter was 11, 10, she met with my son and they called the meeting. So they said we must have a family meeting. So we went for the family meeting. You know what the family meeting was about? They said, Dad and Mom, this family vision that you created, you created it before we were born. Now we have a voice. Can we make input? You know? So I said, okay, what are your inputs? My son said, our family does not. He said, if you say this family is a systems family, he said, how come we don't have coat of arms? He said, so I've gone to research based on what you have said. He said, we need to, say, I've researched the Latin words. He said, amare is honor. So we put amare here. We put, um, you know, three things and design the coat of arms. Then my daughter said, you know, this word, we need to change it because it must reflect our own reality. He said, okay, no problem. But you must champion whatever we decide. He said, no problem. Because... If you understand Generation Z and Alpha, they will hardly promote what they were not a part of. So if you impose it on them, they will frustrate you. 
So sometimes you want to suggest it to them and hear them out. After all, in the Yoruba tradition, we say that the wisdom of the aged and the wisdom of the young is how Ife was founded. So how come we now want to decide everything? Right? So uh, indoctrination is key. If you have done indoctrination very well, you can actually go to bed. But transition point, how did they emerge in the rite of passage and how do you deploy them when contact is made? So there are four battle lines you need to understand as a parent when we talk about new rules. Four battle lines. The first battle line is the battle line of identity. The system of the world is scripted to make your children doubt who they truly are. So if you see the way they are pushing, now they're saying don't assign gender at birth. Right? In fact, they would say the, 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 you're assigned gender at birth. I say, what does that mean? I say, no, you're bad gender, not your assigned birth. You know, so who do we say we are and what does that mean? So what does this mean literally? Every African family has a heritage. You need to go and fish out your heritage and script it in a way that your children can be proud of it. So when I'm attending the meeting, because I'm partly, my mom is from Edo State and I love the history of the Edo State, so I've adopted it. So when I'm introducing myself, I said to them that I am the, I'm, I'm the descendant of the ancestry that created the first smart city in the world. And they said, no, no, no. I said, go to Guinness Book of Records. Go and check Benin City, 1300 to 1700. You will see that we are the best city in the world. We have the street light before New York. And I begin to say to them, and you know, they are quick, they're actually Googling. And they say, oh, nobody taught us this. When your children don't have a sense of heritage, something goes wrong in their identity. So you want to check what is your heritage. So that some of you, you are from a royal family. When your children come out, they know they can't. But do you know that there are instructions you give Prince Charles or Prince Harry that they can't process? You know why? Because they know who they are. They're royalties. That children do drugs, they do sex, they do funny, funny things. is because they have forgotten who they are or they don't know who they are. So identity is a battle line. You need to be aware of the LGBT agenda, the lack of intentional discriminated identity and identity crisis. Number two is our history. What is our heritage? What story are we telling ourselves? And what systems have we built? Number three is the village. Where's the supporting system? We said that it takes a village to raise a child in Africa. Now you must create your village because Pastor Emi cannot send his child back to, send Pelumi back to the village where he came from now. By the time they return, only God knows what they, they have become. So you must now create your own village. Look for 10 families or five who share similar values as your values and make them into your new village and begin to have village meeting. So that you can exchange ideas and co-parent your children together. That's one thing we have as Africans that we must bring back. I always share. I could have been a gambler. But the day my father used to give us 50 kobo. 10, 10 kobo was what we're supposed to spend every day. But God bless the Yalunjes in primary school. Only God knows the kind of thing they put in their eyes. 10 kobo was never enough for me. So by Tuesday, my money was left with 10 kobo. So my friend said, there's a place, if we go in there, if you put the money and you put something down like this, money will come out. So I followed him to the casino. As we got to the casino, I was observing everyone. Ha. People who put money there, they, no, no money will come out. Some money will come out. Ha. I said, should I raise this money? As I was thinking, a man walked in and he looked at me. He says, are you a follower? I said, yes. He said, your father and your line, they don't come to a place like this. He said, you must be a bastard to be showing up here. He said, if you don't... He said, Afira in Yoruba, what it means is, if you don't leave this place right now, what I'll do to you, you will regret. You know, I couldn't even go home. You know, these days, you insult some children or you correct them, they'll go and report to their parents, their parents come and fight. Because as a Yoruba boy, I understood that the man called me a bastard. Because I was behaving out of line. Right? And that is what we need to bring back because all this, my child, my child, my child, after my child is not involved, you see, your child will grow in the larger society. And that's what has led us to where we are. So you want to create your own village, then the mission. Why is your family here? Every family has an assignment. You must find yours. Your assignment can be to create a new order of family for the world or for the kingdom. You need to know yours. What does success mean to us and who do we represent? Now, let me talk a little bit about that. If you don't determine what success means to you, you will be keeping up with the Joneses. So in my family, you receive a phone, maybe I think at 12 or 13, so when my son was nine, he went to school, he said all his friends, they have a phone. So he said his best friend, Chukwemeka, say he has a phone. So I said, what is your name? He said, my name is David Praise for Owe. I said, no, your name must be David Chukwemeka. 
and I want to pack your things and move you to their house now. He said, no, daddy, no, daddy. Of course, he got the message. So he said, we are not going to put ourselves under pressure because one other family is doing it. We are on a journey and we're going to stand by our journey. Are we together? Good. So, having said all of this, who is a parent? Is a parent someone that can flog? Is a parent someone that can beat? Who is a parent, really? A parent is simply a skilled scout that is able to spot the identity of the arrow in the squiver and intentionally, next slide please, shoot and groom in the direction of a predetermined target in a way that the arrow consistently solved the problem it was designed to solve in service to God and humanity. Now, what this means is parenting has a threefold assignment. One, discover your child. Two, develop your child. Three, deploy your child. Many of us don't discover our children because our capacity to observe has been stolen away from us. Your child will show you tips. I always share when my son was in the kindergarten. They called me from school that he was destructive. I said, what does that mean exactly? They say he comes to school and he breaks everybody's pencil. You see, when teachers say things, they often exaggerate. And oftentimes they are not correct. So I followed him to school the following day to observe what he was doing exactly. And guess what? My son got to school. I think he was three. As he got to school, all his other friends were there. The first thing he did is say, everybody, your pencil, your pencil. And they willingly submitted their pencil. <laughs> you know the first thing I saw? Leadership. I saw a leader. To say, it didn't do so to mock boy. To say, everybody submit. And they submitted. That's a leader. So he collects their pencil and he beats it against the table and he breaks. So I noticed that that was a musician. Right? So I bought drumsticks the following day and he no longer broke anybody's pencil. So from that moment, every time we had to choose a school for him, the first thing we checked was the music lab of that school. So we found the school behind, and that's the school family and Nicola Bogotis children were going. My son became the band leader of that school. But that was someone that was misinterpreted as destructive. You can't afford for teachers and schools to label your child and destroy your child. Because let me tell you this. Many of them, they are within the spectrum of right and wrong, up and down, so they can't see the shades of gray within everything they're describing. So your job is to discover your child. Say someone beside you, discover. So there are things your child is signally sending to you. If you don't understand it, go and meet a professional and say, I don't understand what, for every negative thing you think your child is doing, there is a corresponding positive intention. If you walk into your house and your, your, your um, house is flooded with water, right? And your iPhone 14 that you just bought, you have not even finished paying. Your child is playing with it inside water. How will you describe that behavior? <laughs> I know the anger inside of... In fact, your first response will show whether your child is more important than that phone. For some of you, it's the amount of that phone that will be most important. But if you ask the right question, you will look at the child to say, maybe the child actually followed you to a place and saw another house that has a swimming pool. In his mind, he couldn't understand why your owner doesn't have a swimming pool and he's trying to create his first swimming pool. That's a possibility. Second possibility, he might have noticed that when you are mopping the house, you pour water and you use the mop. Maybe he's trying to replicate it. Or your child could be an oceanographer. Your child could be another Michael Phelps, a swimmer. Children show you signal. Oftentimes, we don't pick the signal because it doesn't align with our own wellness. So interpretation becomes very key, discovery. Number two, development. You develop a child based on the traits he's showing, not who you want him to become. Your child must never be a compensation for what you missed in your childhood. Oh, I, I, I wanted to become a doctor. I couldn't become a doctor. That's how medical assassins are birthed. You now impose what is not in the child in him. Imagine how many people could play sports in our days that our, their parents forced to go and study something. Right? So you need to develop and you need to deploy, which talks about leverage. Leverage is key. And that talks about, you know, some teenagers will tell me, they say, Bill Gates dropped out of school. I say, I'm going to drop out of school because you don't need school to make it. I always tell them, Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard, not Uni Loring. <laughs> Did you go to Uni Loring? Wow. He didn't drop out of Exu, Ekiti State University. That was my school. They changed the school three times. When I was in school, the name three times. It, we came in as Ondo State University. They changed the University of Adu Ekiti. When we were graduating, it became Exu. They removed the K, now it becomes a shoe. <laughs> Are we together? Right? 
So I always tell them, for you to be admitted to Harvard shows a measure of intelligence that you are extraordinary. Then number two, when he dropped out, his mother secured a $1 million loan for him. I said, does your mother have $1 million to secure before you go and drop out of school and drop out of <laughs> destiny? Right? It's important for us to help them understand it because leverage is key. Everybody talks about Elon Musk, Elon Musk, Elon Musk. Elon Musk used leverage. Leverage. Because Elon Musk's father is a South African, he was in the University of Pretoria. His mother is from Canada. So when he read that the only nation where you can become anything is America, he told his father he was leaving. His father said he must not leave. But he leveraged on his mother's citizenship to get a Canadian passport. Then he found himself in America. Right? So leverage is key. You need to give your children leverage. That is why you can't keep to yourself and say, I love to keep to myself. No, you must build relationships. Build networks that can stand in the stead for your children. Are we together? Good. Now, having said this, I have nine minutes more. What are the rules of engagement? New rules of engagement. The Bible says if the axe is blunt and no one doesn't, no, one doesn't sharpen the edge, then it must use much strength. But skills bring success. Somebody says skills. You know, skill is not normal. Skill are processed talent. Right? So the first rule is the rule of personal harmony. Right? And that rule says, can we read it together? One to go. A child is at the mercy of the handler's operating system. And until a handler becomes functional, a child is at risk because the engineering of a child is primarily dependent on the state of the handler. See, when a child is born, God literally puts a global destiny in your hand to say, do whatever you like with it. And many of us, we have done whatever we like with it. So that seed has become an angry fruit. That seed has become a root fruit. Simply because we didn't understand and because we have not experienced wellness. Many of us are still responding to the trauma our parents passed us through. And that's why in the first law of the new rule, you first need to heal. You need to heal. Because your interpretation oftentimes is faulty. Go to the next slide. So I'll show you something. So everything a child is doing is mere data. You are the one that gives interpretation. Your interpretation is as a result of your belief system. Your belief system is a function of how you were raised, the environment you grew up in, and your significant emotional experience. So, for example, let's assume that you are a pastor, and your child is Mark Zuckerberg, and it's church time, and the child is uh, doing some uh, research, and say, Daddy, I want to be a scientist. You know, you first beat, your first thing is, especially if you think that science is anti-God, you will think it's the one Antichrist is going to use. So you will beat Facebook out of him, and you say, you, don't, you must serve God. You must serve. And when you talk about service to God, the only thing you are thinking about is holy police or choir. Right? So you say, you must be holy police for God. Oh, no, 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 your church is marching. You know, march to. <laughs> right? You won't know that you yourself, you are standing against God's agenda for humanity. And many of us stand against God's agenda. Right? So your interpretation is key because the moment your interpretation is done, it determines your feelings. Your feelings determine decision, action, and outcome. So I always ask, do you want to be happy or do you want to be sad? If sadness is what you want, everything they report about your child, the only interpretation is negative. Right? So your child is playing with water in your mind. Hey, this child is mommy water. Let us take him to prophet so that they can pray for him. Why can't you think of your child as the next Michael Phelps? Why don't you think of your child as an oceanographer? So interpretation is very key. And you know, the Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue. He told Jeremiah, he said, what seest thou? He said, and you see correctly, many of us will look, but we can't see. Right? So your interpretation must be key. So if you see a child with water flooding the entire space and with a phone inside the water, if you ask me, what do I see? I can see a child. I can see a phone drenched. I can see water. I don't see more than any other thing you see outside of that is your own interpretation and you can be wrong. Number two rule is the rule of expanded awareness. I have six minutes more. Maybe I might stop here. Can we read this together? One to go. The greatest enemies of the new are the custodians of the old. When we're not humble enough to understand and own a stake in the new, we will misrepresent the new and either lose a child's ultimate power or stifle its impact. Uh, its impact. This talks about dispensation, child discovery, history, and systems design. Now, in this rule, 
you need to understand that you cannot use your wisdom of the 18th century to profile and process the new reality in our world. So what does that mean literally? You need to understand, I don't know if Dima mentioned that you are dealing with Generation Z. And in Generation Z, there are four things peculiar about them. Number one, their identity is not defined in their quest for truth. Next slide, please. They are very open to different truths and love to express individual truth. That's why they call them Sorosuke. Right? Everything they see, they want to talk about. So your job as a parent, your response is manage perspective through the power of questioning. So you need to ask, so why are you doing this? You get curious. That's why we say you cannot be a child's teacher unless you become their student. Don't assume you know what they're doing. So number two, they are radically inclusive and connecting to different truths. They understand everyone's style. So if your child comes home now and says, Dad, I have a friend. And you say, who is your friend? Say, my friend is gay. What will be your response? Say, hey, child of devil, child of devil. They are all digital natives. It doesn't mean your child is going to become LGBT, especially if you have done a good job. And let me say this thing about LGBT. What LGBT de deploy the most is pseudo love. They close mark your children and show them a higher level of love. We know it's not love to say we are here for you. You know, so I say to parents, no one must outlove your child more than you. When your child thinks about you, your child must think about bliss. If your child makes a mistake, does your child run home or your child runs away from you? We run away from our parents. Your child must run home. I mean, we were, my son is the, was in the class, so they were asking them, when you have sexual challenges or sexual pressures, or you are, who do you talk to? And my son said, my dad. And the teacher called me and said, your son says you are the one he comes. I said, yes, we talk about it. He said that he was the only one in the class that is his dad. Other people were talking to their friends. If you are talking to your friend, your friend also don't know the answer. So they're going to give them what they are reading. I mean, like many of us talked to our friend and they gave us, doubt that the sexy guy has answer. Maxim. Or what's that name of that magazine? Lolly. Right? Number three, fewer confrontations and more dialogue. They seek to understand everyone's truth. So change must come from dialogue. You cannot say that your appetite must determine their own appetite. No. My father's appetite determines our appetite. That's why I don't drink pap again. Because all the pap for my entire generation, I drank it with my dad. Four times in a week, pap. Ogi. So when I see pap, it traumatizes me. I said, me, you drank pap too. Are, are we together? Because my father's appetite, that was his favorite food. Everybody must drink it. Right? So you are here, you are free to develop your appetite. However, it must be within the ambit of balanced diet, and you must be able to cook. Right? So everybody cooks in the family. So feel what? Confront, more dialogue. Let them be able to talk to you. Have conversations with them. Thank you very much. Right? Let them listen, and you even listen to them. Sometimes do open day. Open day is ask them, if you have to rate my parenting, what will be my rating? What are the things you think I should improve? You will be shocked. If they, don't, if they are not afraid of you, they will tell you things that will shock you. Right? And so you need to listen and hear them out. Right? And number four, they are realistically pragmatic, looking for the truth behind all things, and they are not given to stuff that cannot be proven. So you need to show clear-cut results, especially in our Christianity. Many of our children are running away from our God because they are saying to me that we cannot see the practicality of the God you say you serve in what he has done for you and who you have become as a person. So you, in fact, one teenager, I was having a forum with them. You know the question they asked me? They said, what is it that makes adults cry in church? He said, can they make that thing to beat them more so that they can cry? He said, because someone one them, they said, my father is a terror at home. He said, but when he comes to church and they are doing worship, he sees it, begins to shed tears, and he's wondering, ah, so there's something that can make this man cry like this. Said, can we bring that thing home to make him cry at home? Your children are watching right? And that's why if you say God can do this, God can do it, they want to see God do it. That's why I always say that we need to build our relationship with God to be able to produce results, especially practical results to conventional problems in our world. Are we together? So having said that, let me tidy this up. I can't finish this message. Um, there are things you need to observe. So one, what must you do? Observe your child carefully first as a student to discover his or his personal power. Every child has got personal power. Cast your mind back. When your child was between ages 0 to 3, what can you remember? What were the things they were doing? That's why you need to keep journal. Journal the entire journey. Right? Between 4 to 6, what can you remember? Between 7 to 9, what questions were they asking? 10 to 12, 
and between 13 to 18. Number two, creating a working script that can guide your child's conduct and every other giver. Your child is not being raised alone by you. So you need to create a script so that when people come, house elves, uh, moms, uh, grandmother, when they come, you show them the document. This is who this child is. This is how to correct him. Because sometimes, I mean, if um, Pelumi is playing with Pastor Yemi now and they're arguing, a grandmother can be offended to say, ah, you are rude to your dad. No, it's not rude. That's how we roll. We're communicating, but they can't understand. One day, my son was playing drum on my head, and my mother said, ah, you don't respect your dad. I said, mom, that's not how we define respect. We're playing. Because I couldn't even play with my dad. I started sitting with my dad when he was 60, and he died at 62. Oh, yes. So the, the gap that existed, I didn't want it to exist. So my son should be able to tell me everything. So it's important to keep a journal, run a personality test for your child, create your child uses manual, ask questions and adjust accordingly, depending on the age appropriateness of your child. Now my time is up, but let me challenge you. I believe that God is depending on your family to transform our world. And let me tell you, don't always think your family has to be perfect. God chose a dysfunctional family of Jacob and made it into a nation called Israel. Jacob's family is one of the worst families you can think about. That you came to church to get married, and in the evening they gave you another person that was not the person you took vows with. And they say you must marry the person. Then they say you must marry the sister and slave for another. Then the sister and the one you married now have a housemaid. They started giving you the housemaid to procreate. That's a dysfunctional family. But with the dysfunctionality, God still chose Israel as a race. So God has chosen your family regardless of your imperfection. What you need to align with is God's agenda because God's plan is to raise a new generation of children who will be godly, who will stand out, and they will make him proud. Not children who are bowing their head and they always say, become transgender, and they become transgender, come and take care of marijuana. It's children who are genuinely happy. But you see, you can't raise genuinely happy children if you have not created a happy environment at home. A happy environment cannot be created if the two of you are not genuinely happy. And that's why the conversation has to start between husband and wife. To say, what are the pain points in our lives? Who had the better parenting experience? Can that person show us a template and lead a family so that we can all benefit and our children can learn by observation and we can raise wholesome children? My prayer is that you will not fail God in the mighty name of Jesus. God told Abraham, he said, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. My prayer is that God will bless the families of the earth through you. That your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be their peace in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. God bless you.